and welcome to On The Ledge podcast, bringing you planty information and fun since February 2017. I'm your host, Jane Perrone, and in this week's show, it's part two of our pest control special. I'm talking about biological controls with Tessa Cobley and Andy Brown. Plus, I answer a question about oxalis bulbs, and we hear from listener Tate. Thanks to my new patrons this week, Amanda became a crazy plant person, Esther and Tari became legends, and Simon became a superfan, while Jane left a payment on co-fi.com. So, whether you want to just make a one-off Act of kindness by supporting the show. You can do that via co-fi or straight through PayPal. Or if you want to become a patron and make a monthly contribution and unlock extra benefits like twice monthly episodes of An Extra Leaf, my bonus podcast, it's up to you. All the details are in the show notes at janeperone.com. A special request now, I am finally putting together my episode on The Houseplant Expert, the book that has inspired me and many other people to get into houseplants from a young age. And I would love to have your input. So if you've got a copy of The Houseplant Expert, if you perhaps bought one on my recommendation or you've had one for years, I would love you to record a quick voice memo on your phone telling me, what the book means to you and what you love about it. It can be as little as 10 seconds long. It would be great to have your voices in the show. So just record a voice memo on your phone. Send that in to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and you might be hearing yourself in the show. Remember to include your name and where you are in the world. And don't be shy. Remember, we had Susie, who's only seven, taking part in Meet the Listener. So you can do it. I believe in you. Scottish Plant Dad on Instagram got in touch with a great recommendation for listener Rachel, who was looking for some plant that would grow in a window above a panel heater. And we were discussing ways that you can keep your plants elevated away from the heater while still in the window. And Scottish Plant Dad's idea is brilliant. It is a radiator washing dry rail. Now, if you don't know exactly what I mean, it's a piece of metal with white plastic coating on it like you get dryers made out of. But this one has hooks on it that hook onto the window ledge or indeed onto the window itself and allow the plants to sit there and then you can hang things off it. If you're really struggling to envisage my poor description of this item, I will put a link in the show notes so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Scottish Plant Dad has also hung them from the window blinds, so there's different options. So that's a great addition to our chat about window aesthetics and what you can put there in order to cram in more plants. So thank you, Scottish Plant Dad. It's also time for an On The Ledge Sew Along update. I haven't had a chance to sew anything more yet. And to be totally honest, if you have not sewn a thing yet, do not panic. You have plenty of time. So that's a little message uh, if you are starting to worry that you haven't got your seeds in yet. There is loads of time, so do not be disturbed about that. I've got lots more things I'm going to be sewing in the next few weeks when I get a chance, which will probably be, I hope, over the Easter holidays when I've stopped painting everything in sight. I've been painting my fence, my shed, my front room, random pieces of shelving. It's all been happening with the paintbrush here and I've probably still got some paint in my hair right now but hopefully once that's all over I can get on with some sewing which is far more fun. But what have you been up to? Well, Joan in Geneva in Switzerland has posted on Instagram showing off some morning glories. <laughs> Uh, lovely flowers, very beautiful trumpet shaped blooms, which can grow outside and some people do grow them inside as well. So well done, Joan. Spicy Terracotta in Pennsylvania has been sowing seeds with third graders. Well done, Spicy Terracotta. And lots of things have been popping up, including Monstra Deliciosa and Marigold. 
Spot 9 girl in Maryland in the US has been sowing Gazneriad Society seeds. That's very exciting. I hope you know if you're a regular listener that if you join the Gizneriad Society, you can be part of their seed scheme and, and get some excellent seeds to try. Uh, Jonathan in Pennsylvania has been sowing coleus and basil and more. Yes, I need to sow my coleus. That's my top uh, sowing item at the moment. And proper propagule, what a great name, has baby syningia leukotricha seedlings. Awesome. Bear Tomatoes on Instagram has an impressive array of seedlings. I'm feeling slightly intimidated, Bear Tomatoes. And over on Facebook in the Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge group, John has been posting about a Joshua tree, that's Yucca brevifolia. The seeds are all germinated and getting settled into soil. And John's been wondering about the questing radicals that bend down to find the soil and make a hairpin turn in the first root. Apparently it's typical of the species, but it sure looks weird, John writes. Anyone got any insight into that? <laughs> I'd love to know, and so would John. Sydney has cactus and succulent seeds for the so long. Well done for getting hold of those, Lindsay. And I put a link in your post to a great leaflet from the British Cactus and Succulent Society on how to sow cactus and succulent seeds, which I'll link in the show notes as well. Alina is looking for tips on chilli seed sowing. Do go back and listen to the chilli episode, Alina. And what I would say about chilies is they need loads of light and lots of warmth. So, yeah, if you can put them on a heat mat, uh, public service announcement, always use a thermostat with a heat mat. Otherwise, they can be dangerous or a special propagator. Then you will get that give them that heat they need. Once they're germinated, you can turn it off. It's just for the germination process. But make sure they're in a nice sheltered spot and that you don't let them dry out and hopefully you'll have some success. And Emma has been posting on Facebook and her daughter has been getting in on the seed sowing and sowing Mimosa pudica. What a cool plant that is. I must do an episode on that sometime because it's so popular. So many people grow it for the sow along and it's really cool. So uh, maybe I'll add that to my list of episode ideas, which is admittedly huge, <laughs> but I do love all your recommendations for episodes. So if you do want to hear me talk about something, then do let me know. I am in search of a syningia expert because somebody has requested an episode on those and as a Gesneriad fan I'm not going to say no to that so if you know any Syningia experts put them in touch. So it's not too late to get involved in the sew along if you haven't listened to those sew along episodes I will put a link in the show notes so you can listen to them all and catch up and yeah just keep on sewing people it's great fun and it doesn't always work my my clivia seeds have not germinated boo but I've had lots of success. Oh, and I've also not had my agave seedlings germinate either, but I have had success with my Selenocereus and my Astrophytum and the wonderful Hoya serpane seeds that I've got. So you win some, you lose some. That's life, isn't it? If you haven't listened to episode 176, the episode preceding this one, then stop. Go and have a listen to that first, because in this episode, I'm running the second part of my interview on biological controls with Tessa Cobley of Ladybird Plant Care and Andy Brown of Andermatt UK. And in this second part of the interview, we get into the matter of treatments for thrips, mealybugs and scale, why BTI counts as a biological control and what the colours of different sticky traps mean. Let's just talk a little bit about mealybugs. When I did a mealybug episode, there seemed to be some doubt over whether there was a effective biological control for mealybugs. Is that still the case or is anything anything on the horizon that really can tackle this very annoying pest of our cacti and succulents? The brown Australian ladybirds are the predator that I sell for mealybug but I do put a lot of caveats and talk to people carefully about how they're growing the conditions that they're growing in where the plants are because being a crawling then flying creature you're going to have to try and keep them on the plant giving them enough light and warmth to do their job and I think as your expert said on that episode they need a lot of mealybug to encourage them to stick around, which is why they don't work as well as other biologicals for other pests. 
I think it's best to put it that way, really. This is the thing. If you've got a big greenhouse full of cacti and succulents, it might be might be effective, but possibly not if you've just got a few, you know, couple of mealybugs on a succulent on the windowsill. There's an awesome, um, if anyone wants to look it up, the University of Exeter had a problem with mealybugs in their atrium, beautiful glass atrium. They've got some trees with mealybug. And they introduced the brown Australian ladybirds and they covered the trees in um, horticultural fleece. Um, so the trees look like these big clouds um, while the ladybirds are doing their job. And that's to keep keep that biological control in place. I see. Well, I went to Exeter and I don't remember trees in an atrium. I think they must have fancied it up since I was there. Wow. <laughs> it's a bit fancier now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, have a look. Yeah. On their Instagram. It's really interesting. Um, they only did one post on it, but there's a bit of commentary underneath. And I think there's a there's a place where you can have a look for more information. But yeah, I was I, I've seen it in other countries. Um, trees covered in in fleece fleece or mesh to keep biologicals in in place. But that's the first time I'd really seen it being used properly in the UK. With these ladybirds, obviously that they're not UK natives, is there a concern about them escaping into the environment or would they just not survive outside because it's not Australia? As Andy said, everything that's being used in the UK is perfectly safe and it does pose no threat to the indigenous populations. Well, that's good to hear. One of the other things that I'm confused about is BTI-based products like mosquito dunks and bits. Is that classed as a biological control to start with? And do they actually work against fungus gnats? I would really love to know the answer to that as somebody who spent a lot of money on a tub of these things and hasn't had much success with them so far. Do they count as a biological control? They do. So there are there are four categories of biological control. So there's uh, semiochemicals. They're chemicals that are uh, released by, um, or typically the ones are released by insects for communicating with each other. Uh, there are microbials, so things like bacteria and fungi, and BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensi, is a, is a microbial, or classified as a microbial. Then we have macrobiologicals, um, things you tend to be able to see, so the insects, the mites, the nematodes that we've been talking about mostly. And then there are natural substances, so they would be things like your plant extracts. So yes, BTI is a biological control. And how come it's widely available in the US, but really hard to get hold of in the UK? Is it just not licensed here for use by home growers? Correct. It, the products available vary from country to country. And the part of that is the registration requirements in different countries. And yeah, BTI is not approved for use in the UK. Is that because it's not safe or just because it hasn't gone through the, the hurdles for being approved? It hasn't gone through the hurdles of being approved for the um, home and garden market. BT is an incredibly safe product with a very long history um, of use. And um, be it BTI for controlling uh, fly larvae, uh, dipteras or um, BTKs you can use against uh, lepidoptera caterpillars. Uh, and there are a couple of other BTs in other parts of the world as well. Do you have to soak it in water and then apply the water onto the plants? Is that the best method? It doesn't need soaking before use, but yeah, you're, you're looking to put it into the compost. Then you're looking for the fly larvae to consume it. And um, what BT has in it, it has a, a toxin that breaks down the gut of the of the insect. So you're looking to put it into the soil and then for the fly larvae to consume it. Okay, so I need to sort of mix it in when I'm repotting. Is that? Yeah, or, or spraying it onto the top of the soil should work. And depending on how moist your soil is, the fly larvae tend to live uh, nearer the top of the soil surface. So as long as you get it into contact with, with the flies, yeah, either by spraying the surface or by incorporating it as you're potting. Right. OK, that makes sense. Uh, well, I'll give it another go. Uh, I've got a big tub of the stuff. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's interesting that I did manage to get hold of some when it's not licensed in the UK. I can't quite remember where I got it from, but I guess that's the wild west of the Internet for you. <laughs> I mean, I guess it also the, the same applies to in the here in the UK where neem oil is not licensed for pesticide use, but people manage to get hold of it and use it anyway. So I guess it's the same kind of thing in terms of the differences between different different markets and different regulatory systems. One of the other things that people I wanted to know was whether you could combine a biological control such as, say, um, something for, you're treating for spider mites with a spray, like a, a soap spray that you might be using. So if you're using or something like SB Plant Invigorator, 
Can you combine the two or is that spray going to also kill your biological control? I tend to tell people to use a spray up until they receive their, their, their biological control. Partly because using the spray before they arrive is a really good idea to reduce pest numbers so that when the biologists arrive they don't have such a big task but also because it's a bit of a wide question and it's not one one fits all something like phytosilus for spider mite you can use that with the with the sb they're so fast moving they're not they're not going to be too affected by the sb plant invigorator um it's a contact insecticide so it doesn't leave a residue that's going to last and and get rid of any insects you're killing them on contact so for the phytosilus doesn't bother them they're so fast they just keep moving but because you don't want to add too much confusion when people are using biologicals and potentially using biologicals for the first time i tend to say to people to stop using their homemade shop-bought non-chemical insecticide you know the night before their biologicals are due to arrive just to avoid any confusion and to make sure that you're not getting rid of any of your biologicals that you've ordered you're not reducing those in numbers as you're reducing the pests in numbers sure that makes total sense one of the other pests that people seem to have real problems with i have to say touch i'm touching wood now i have never suffered from this particular pest but thrips seem to be a real issue for many people um and sarah got in touch because she was confused about the different types of predatory mites that you can get for thrips um and has been told there's a preventative one and one to use when there's presence can you just go through that one of you to just explain the differences of for thrip treatments uh, cucumeris and swirskii is that right yeah, so Cucumerus is the slow-release product that I mentioned that comes, well, predominantly is sold in, in sachets with the breeding colony that crawl out over four to six weeks and eat the larval stage of the thrips. Um, the other product that she mentions isn't licensed for home growers in the UK. It requires slightly warmer temperatures as well, so it's not something that is sold in the in the sort of houseplant arena, in this country anyway. Um the other products you can use um nematodes as well and if you've really got a big thrip problem there's a brilliant bug called aureus and they are super fast and they eat all stages of the thrips so they're obviously much more effective because they're not just killing um and eating the smaller thrips and the young thrips they're eating the adults as well so you, if you've got a big thrip problem and you want to get it sorted once and for all then the well not necessarily for all um but want to get it properly sorted then you'd go with the aureus and one other question on a different pest that we haven't mentioned yes yet are there any biological controls for scale yeah again you can you can use nematodes for scale as a foliar spray it requires a little bit more attention to detail because once you you may need to use a product to break the surface tension on the leaf, just like a soft soap or something like that, and then you spray the nematodes solution onto the plant and you then need to mist the plant a few times afterwards to keep that level of moisture onto the foliage because obviously we've talked about the fact that nematodes are a swimming creature and the, that's part of the reason they work really well for scale because they can actually get underneath the scale which nothing else can. I get a strange satisfaction from scraping away at scale. I don't know, I'm a bit of a... Yes, sick. I saw someone <laughs> using masking tape to like wax their plants. Yes, I mean, it, there's all kinds of ways of de dealing with it. I mean, I, I I say that, then I did have it on one plant which had particularly corrugated leaves and that was a nightmare because uh, that's where I could have really done with a biological control because it was just so difficult to, to get them off the leaves, especially the young ones, without damaging the leaves. So yes, I can imagine that would work extremely well. Andy, are there any things on the horizon in the world of biological controls very much so it's for me it's a really exciting industry to be part of because it is moving so quickly the biocontrol industry is growing at a rapid rate globally and 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 the uk is is the same as that there are a range of new uh, predators and parasitoids coming through uh, where they tend to start is they they tend to start in commercial horticulture uh, high value crops uh, and protected crops and um, because similar to the fleecing around the trees in extra keeping them where you want them to be is a challenge and so the technologies tend to start in greenhouses uh, and then they 
uh, evolve and come to the home and home and garden market. So what do we need to do to help uh, domestic growers really get to grips with biological controls? What's the best thing people can do if they want to get bi- into biological controls, but they don't really know where to start? Is it just a question of doing your research and first and figuring out what pest you've got? I mean, I always recommend that people get themselves a hand lens so they can really see their pests up close. I mean, is that the best place to start? Yeah, I think that's really important when I speak to customers is them really, really knowing what pest they have. And if they're really not sure, they can send photographs, descriptions of the damage, pictures of the damage and um, get help with with identifying what pest they've got in the first place because you can't really go anywhere without knowing what problem you're dealing with. And there's a mountain of information out there available online, either searching through uh, Google or going onto YouTube. There are loads of people who post videos on common problems they have and what they've done about it. Um, and, And for us as suppliers, it's important for us to educate and work with our customers. And, and as I said, the people who work in this industry are very passionate about it and we're always happy to talk to people about what it is they have and what they need to do. I just worry sometimes about the the poor advice that's out there on the internet, <laughs> not about specifically about biological controls, but about, you know, how to deal with pests. You know, some weird concoctions that people are mixing up. That worries me. Yeah, I think the neem oil, you mentioned neem oil, and I worry that people are just liberally spraying neem oil on everything and hoping hoping for the best, and also then using neem oil once their biologicals are in place and potentially getting rid of the biologicals at the same time. And also, as I said at the beginning, people buying ladybirds for everything. There is a specific predator for most pests, and... It's the same, like with nematodes, people don't realise until they go to buy the nematode that they are pest, a lot of them are pest specific. Um, it's the same with the crawling, crawling saviours. They, they are pest specific on the whole as well. And, and you can't just buy the one that worked for your friend's plants because your friend might have had a different yeah. pest. So maybe I should qualify what I said is there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, and it's finding a good reliable source of information yeah. is important so a, yeah. a brand or a retailer that's recognized and has a good reputation and using what they say rather than just what joe blogs did yeah there's a lot of people i think who just freak out so hard when they find a pest that they just want to kill it with fire basically i mean the number of times i see somebody with a you know wanting a de- identification on a, for a, for a pest indoor or outdoor and there's always somebody who replies with kill it with fire and i'm just like what is i find that a really strange mentality that you know anything that's living that isn't exactly where you want it you want to destroy it but um yeah but then they they seem to be the same people that then when you suggest introducing a mite oh i don't want those in my house <laughs> is that a fear then that people think they're going to sort of take over and um you know uh, that 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 does seem to be a fear that people have i mean i i kind of want to tell them you do realize you have mites living on your face yeah um <laughs> But that might blow their minds. There seems to be two, especially with the questions that um, came up when you asked, there was two kind of camps. There was one camp of people that didn't want more bugs in their house um, and were worried about them overproducing out of control. Um, And then the other camp wanted to work out how they could get them to reproduce and almost build their own biological control factory inside their house. Which presumably is not possible. I mean, that it, you, 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 they're there for a set amount of time unless you want the three-storey fermenting tube. Well, and also you'd, you'd have to keep introducing pests for them to eat. So you'd be, you'd be kind of, yeah, you, you, you're introducing them to get rid of the pest that's attacking your plant. So if, if you want to keep, yeah, you, you don't want to rear more pests to eat your plant so that you can keep the biologicals alive. I can see the flaw in that argument. That is... <laughs> That's a good point. Leave it to the professionals because it all sounds like it's it's very high tech and um, not something that we can do at home. But I guess what we should be concentrating on doing is making sure that we read the packet and make apply them properly because that is the best way of getting the best out of them, right? Yeah, and if you're not sure, ask. Just ask. If you're not sure what you've got, ask. If you're not sure how to use it, pick up the phone, you know... Don't worry, there's plenty of people that are happy to help you identify your pest and help you to get rid of it too. Once you've seen spider mites wandering about on a leaf, uh, you it suddenly focuses your mind that you actually do have a problem when... 
unfortunately, a lot of people don't realise they've got spider mite until they see the webbing. And at that point, you're quite far down. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. And then outside, the creatures that are nocturnal, for example, slugs and vine weevil, which are the two product, two pests that are the most prolific, they have different, different ways in which they eat your leaves. So you can look for the pattern by which they're munching in your garden. Oh, I know those signs very well for the vine weevil. They're, they really they turn are, your leaves uh, into little jigsaw pieces. They do. They do. And they're horrible. But um, I, I mean, and, and I'm, I guess sometimes occasionally people do manage to bring those inside if they've left their plants outside. They, they are really a pest of outside. But um, I imagine there'll be a few listeners who've had. Yes. And they're of, often in your pots on your patio. So they'll have a little trip indoors. Yes. And those C-shaped larvae, as I always... Uh, uh, you, it's they're quite satisfying when you. <laughs> well, I had the experience of lifting up a heuchera and literally it coming away in my hand because they've eaten all the roots, and then you got to dig down and and you find all and these. You find them. Yeah. When we were talking about prevention earlier, I think with something like slugs or vine weevil, you don't have to worry about there being any of those pests. They're there, so getting that treatment down early in the spring to avoid problems later on is really important. And I know slugs are really outdoor pests, but I did yesterday turn over an Oxalis triangularis uh, pot and discover slugs hiding underneath. And I thought, that's why these leaves have been damaged. So they do, yeah, yeah. they can. People, yeah. people tell me that they find slug trails on their stairs. People talk about, obviously, barrier methods for slugs and crushing eggshells and putting various things around their plants to try and save them and uh, for our wedding we had c- tiny cactus plants as our wedding favours and I transported them all in the boot of my car and lo and behold I left them in overnight lo and behold in the morning there was a slug trail across the top of the cactus plants so yeah some of them really don't care about sharp stuff they do no I think all of those barrier things are, are I always just say like if you're if you feel like it's you're enjoying doing it then do it but otherwise it's really not worth the time they will walk they will go over walk they're not walking they will slime over anything won't they they really will well we've covered i think we've covered all the questions that we had from listeners is there anything else that we haven't discussed that we need to squeeze in here uh, that might offer up any expertise for listeners on the wonderful world of biological controls. Um, I think Andy, Andy touched on it slightly about traps. I think it might be worth just mentioning the technology behind traps and how useful trap uh, for me, for for my customers and the people that I speak to. Traps are great to help people with identification. So having a few sticky traps up in your, in amongst your uh, your indoor jungle is a is a good idea because. It'll give you early signal that there is a pest present and helped you to identify it with your hand lens as well. And actually, if you're looking at controlling within a within a household in a small area, the traps will help with that management of the pest because you're taking out adults from the population. So it has two benefits. So fungus nets, I would go nematodes and yellow sticky trap. And uh, the one thing I find with those sticky traps is that I end up sticking them to myself, <laughs> my hair. Perfect. Any tips for actually getting them into situ- into place without um, getting yourself <laughs> trapped? <laughs> I would um, put them in place first. Or some of uh, some people cut them cut them up smaller, um, put them in place, and then and then take the take the protective paper off. And Andy, why are they yellow? Is there a reason for that? Yeah, again, it goes back to the science that goes into these sorts of things, which you might not really consider. It, yellow has been identified as certainly for for scarabs, for, for fungus gnats, as the colour the adults are attracted to. So, depending on the pest, um, you'll have different colour traps. So, yellow is the one you commonly find for household plants because the fungus gnat is such a problem but if you go out into horticulture you have blue white black uh, patterned unpatterned red ones now as well for leaf hopper and thrips it's blue so if people have got a thrips problem it's, it's blue sticky trap oh well uh, that's fascinating i've learned something new there well you should have watched David Attenborough last night, zebras don't get flies on them like horses do because the flies can't work out where to land because of the black and white stripes. Okay, I'm going to tell my horse-owning friends immediately to paint their (laughs) horses with stripes. That is an amazing fact to finish on. Well, thank you both for joining me and for answering all those many questions. And hopefully that's given us all a bit of an insight into how to use these biological controls effectively and to get the best out of them uh, because they can save us from all kinds of 
infestation problems that we're face we face and i know my listeners get very upset when their house plants get infested with pests and damage so it's good to know that there are controls out there that will really help out with this problem without uh, causing too much damage to the environment so thank you very much both of you for joining me tessa and andy pleasure thank you jane pleasure do check out the show notes at janeperone.com where you'll find information about the stuff we talked about in that interview including BTI, treatments for thrips and links to the Exeter University mealybug treatment on their atrium trees. And now it's time for question of the week and the question comes from Claire who has a question about a beloved purple shamrock. Purple shamrock, well that's Oxalis triangularis, although most of the time we forget to add on the last, which is subspecies Papillionacea. Obviously Papillion meaning butterfly. Claire has found that her plant has been thinned out over the winter by losing some leaves. Don't worry Claire, this is totally, totally normal. For Oxalis triangularis, they do tend to go dormant in winter or at least lose a certain amount of leaves. Claire is worried because some of the base of the plant is exposed and not covered in soil. And she's worried that the stems being exposed is going to damage the plant in some way. And notes, typically everything else in my collection gets more rooted in compost. This is a great question. Oxalis triangularis grows from corms, which are, well, they're a bit like bulbs, except they don't have lots of different layers. And the corms are what makes this Oxalis quite so good, because if it does die back in the winter, as they are prone to do, or indeed if you keep it outside, you can grow this as an outdoor plant. It will die back in winter and then revive itself. The plant is able to store resources in that corm and regrow, which is a pretty neat trick. I think you'll agree. So how deep should these corms be buried in the soil? Oxalis is very, very easy going. So in many respects, I'd say don't worry too much. I have planted them as much as five centimetres below the soil and not had a problem with them sprouting. I have also got some plants where the corms are right on the surface. Equally, no problem. Generally, the rule with planting bulbs and corms is that the bulb or corm should be about three, at least three times the depth of the diameter of the bulb. So what that means is if you measure your bulb across and it's a centimetre across, then it should be at least three centimetres under the surface, if not more. Why? Well, this helps the plant to be stable for the plant to develop a good root system and for the corm or bulb not to dry out too quickly and well in the outside world anyway not be uh, dug up too easily by any creatures that might have an eye on them such as squirrels but as I say in the house they can be grown on the surface or near to the surface without too much of a problem the main problem you're going to come across is that those stems aren't very well anchored into the soil if this is a problem for your plant it's easy enough to solve you just need to take the plant out of its pot carefully tease out those corms with their attached stems and be careful because they are quite fragile and just replant them with more soil around the stems and you'll find that the plant will be absolutely fine, especially if you do it at this time of year when the plant is really starting to motor away and put on new growth. If you don't have any Oxalis triangularis in your life, do go and listen to my special episode on this plant. It's a wonderful one, and you can pick up the corms quite cheaply from garden centres and on places like eBay and other platforms. They're sold in packs for outdoor growing, and that really is the cheapest way of getting hold of them. The most expensive way is by buying an established plant. Um, if you're really worried about starting something off from a corm, of course, you can go down this route, but you get much more for your money if you go down the corm route. And yes, it can also count as part of the On The Ledge Sew Along. Somebody messaged me the other day saying, if I plant these, uh, I can't think it was either Colocasia, I think it was Colocasia or Caladium tubers, does that count for the sew along? To which my answer was, of course it does. That's absolutely fine. So do get hold of this plant if you can. 
There are other species of oxalis that you can grow. I really like oxalis tetraphylla, which is the iron cross oxalis, which is a popular outdoor plant. And there's also Oxalis corymbosa aureo reticulata with the beautiful network of yellow veins, which is very fun too. If you are starting these plants off, just put them somewhere warm and sunny and you should find that they sprout soon enough. If you are sowing caladium tubers this spring, as so many listeners seem to do, warning from me having had experiences with this in the past make sure that you give them plenty of heat caladiums they're tropical plants they like lots of heat as opposed to the oxalis which is a bit more of a cool temperate plant and isn't so bothered but yeah those caladium bulbs they need lots of warmth and heat so put them on your sunniest windowsill and use a propagator for those if you can but jolly old oxalis triangularis shove them in a pot and they'll pretty much grow I hope that's helpful, Claire. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge Podcast, drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com is the address. And be like Claire. Claire put a nice couple of pictures of her plant in and gave me lots of information. And that's what makes my job nice and easy. And let's wrap up the show with Meet the Listener. And our listener this week is Tate. Hi everybody, my name is Tate. I'm 28 and I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is located in the north central part of the United States. We experience a huge temperature change throughout the year, and keeping house plants is a great way to offset the winter here. During the day, I'm a section grower for a large wholesale greenhouse, which is over 20 acres of covered greenhouse space. We're the largest greenhouse in South Dakota. We grow exclusively for a large orange big box store here in the Midwest, focusing on spring bedding plants and perennials that are hardy to our general area of the country. It's so much fun to see the greenhouses fill up as the spring progresses. When I get home, I enjoy puttering around my large houseplant collection and the challenge of sneaking another in without my girlfriend noticing. I'm a big fan of Hoya, I like staghorn fern, orchids, aeroids, and I've also really been interested lately in epiphytic cacti and ant plants. You've been selected to travel to Mars as part of the first human colony on the red planet. There's only room for one houseplant from your collection on board. Which plant do you choose? In the off event that someone let me on a spaceship, I bring a monster adansonii. It has proved to be such a resilient plant for me and is quite tolerant of neglect. I'd like to think it would make a great plant trade with a Martian. Then again, this is why I probably wouldn't be allowed on the spaceship. Question two, what is your favorite episode of On The Ledge? On The Ledge has provided many excellent episodes and my favorite is the one with Tyler Thrasher. Tyler has been such an eloquent voice in to help guide people through the nonsense of the last year. Not only has he been a pivotal voice in the plant community in 2020, but he is also an expert in many of the things he pursues. It's always so impressive to see every new endeavor that Tyler is posting about on Instagram and the wisdom that he's always talking about in his plant rants. Question three, which Latin name do you say to impress people? Scientific names have a reputation as being difficult to understand, but it's not the case. And I believe that one of the best things you can do in your journey of knowing your plants better is to learn and use the scientific names. These names allow you to communicate with other people about these specific plants all across the globe. Whether you're speaking English, French, Japanese, it's always going to be the same. And usually these Latin names are going to tell you something about the plant. Sometimes it describes the location the plant is from, a notable characteristic, the person who first described the plant. Personally, one of my favorites that I like to tell people about is Begonia Darth Vaderiana. Maybe someday I'll be cool enough to have a plant named after me. Question four, crassulation, acid metabolism, or gutation? Gutation is cool to see in action, but overall I think that cam is just much more interesting. Cam is such a specialty adaptation to survive an extreme environment, and really as a grower, I just see gutation as a symptom of overwatering. 
Plus, Cama is practiced by a number of species of Hoya, which really are my favorite kind of plant. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? With the current plant prices, I don't know that I would get much more than a hunk of stem if I bought a $200 variegated monstera. I could probably find 20 interesting cacti, and lately I've been quite interested in epiphytic cacti. I grew out some Pseudorypsalis ramulosa from seed for the OTL so long last year, and I plan to grow out more this year. Right now I'm on the hunt for a soft tail monkey cactus or Hilda Wintera coladimonensis. I think that the epiphytic cacti are so cool and I find it just super fascinating how they challenge all the concepts that you have as a keeper of cacti, but it grows in the trees. Thank you, Tate. What I love about Meet the Listener is the diversity of the people who love this show. So why not put yourself forward? Drop a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and my oh so efficient assistant Kelly will be in touch with instructions. is all for this week's show and if anyone's desperate to know the colour of the walls in my front room it's called mineral mist that's mineral mist (laughs) I'm not sure if I want a mist of minerals on my walls but uh, the colour's quite nice it's pale blue basically that's all for this week I will see you in exactly seven days time bye The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Rash and Rapidity Picara by Samuel Corwin, Chiefs by Jazar, and Sundown by Josh Woodward. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes at janeperone.com for details. 